Hello and welcome to a very, very special program. It's been a remarkable G20 process for India. The Delhi Declaration is through. Many people around the world would have felt that it would have been difficult to get a Delhi Declaration out, but it is out. In fact, today is the last day. It was all decided yesterday. So it's been a tough process, a difficult process, but at the end of the day, an efficient process and the consensus that has been arrived at is absolutely huge. We're joined by a very special guest, uh, Harsh Tringla, the Chief Coordinator for India for uh, G20. Uh, you must be pretty relieved at this stage. I mean, what, hundreds of rounds of talks and negotiations. You know, before we get into the specifics, are you a happy man today? And you must be fairly tired as well. well I'm very pleased. Right. We're very pleased with the with the outcomes that have been delivered and uh, that we are today uh, on the second day of the summit and uh, everything seems to be going as per plan, including the expected showers. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, the big international question, of course, is how did India deal with the entire issue of Ukraine? The fact uh, that the word Russia uh, was missing in, in, the, in the declaration itself, whereas last time around it did find mention. Uh, so some would interpret this as um, a climb down by the West, uh, some would interpret the fact that we have encouraged or the community has encouraged the export of Russian food items as something that meets their requirements as well. So was this really a balancing process? Well, throughout our presidency, as you're aware, uh, the, you know, while we had consensus on the most important issues facing mankind today, whether it's sustainable development, there's growth, there's reform of multilateral institutions, women-led development, uh, the geopolitical issue did uh, throw a bit of the a bit of a spanner in the works for the simple reason that the ideological divide globally actually cuts across the G20. India, of course, is is very well placed because we are regular invitees to the G7. We're members of Quad, but at the same time, we are members of the BRICS and SCO. So we straddle that ideological divide. And, uh, and I think uh, the fact that we got a consensus document uh, with all of our country, all of our partner countries agreeing uh, to, uh, to a formulation that uh, uh, suits their requirements is testimony to the importance of the G20 process, mm -hmm. testimony to the fact that today the issues that are there at a global level, which are basically socio-economic and financial in nature, needs to be addressed by a grouping like the G20 and it's also testimony to India's leadership on the global stage and the Prime Minister's own stature in that regard. Of course, you mentioned the, you know, the geopolitical paragraphs that appear under the chapter which is entitled Planet, People, Peace and Prosperity, which is also telling. Yes. There are eight paragraphs and I think if you look at those paragraphs, uh, you will find a distinct imprint of India's positions on the issue. Absolutely. There is a reference to the UN Charter, there is a reference to uh, you know, international sovereignty and territorial integrity, uh, there is a reference uh, to uh, you know, the fact that uh, uh, it, these issues have to be uh, looked at from the prism of diplomacy and dialogue. And, this is not a type of and war. today is not an era of war. Yeah. I think those are very, very significant positions that we have maintained and those are very amply reflected in those eight paragraphs that are consensus paragraphs at a geopolitical level, which brings the world together. It unites the world under our theme of Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil work very closely with us in addressing the Ukraine concerns, right? The usage of words, how it would be uh, drafted. Could you tell us about their role? Well, you know, traditionally the Troika uh, is, uh, you know, a sort of a, uh, an informal uh, construct within the G20. Uh, that provides, uh, you know, mutual support in, in steering any process forward uh, because they represent the past and the future. Of course, uh, as the current president, we uh, take most of the initiatives. But uh, both these countries have been immensely helpful. They share our vision uh, at the global level. Uh, but I must say that all G20 countries, and this was brought out amply in the press statement, press conference yesterday uh, by the External Affairs Minister, Finance Minister, Sherpa, uh, that uh, all countries actually uh, put their shoulders behind the effort to have a consensus on the issues of the utmost global importance. There's also a team which has been involved, um, you know, through the toughest negotiations. The Sherpa mentioned it yesterday, the couple of IFS officers who worked very closely with him. There would have been several other officers who worked with you. So, uh, you know, beneath the level of, uh, of, of you, the Sherpa, uh, the foreign minister and the foreign secretary, 
who were some of the key team members that pushed this through? Did the, the hard slog as it were? Not to say that you didn't. Well, uh, <laughs> present company accepted, of course. <laughs> but uh, it's important to say that this has been a whole of government effort, if not a whole of nation effort. I mean, to host an event like a G20 presidency has required government, the central government, the state governments, the municipalities, but also the support of the public at large. Yeah. This process has been driven by the vision of the Prime Minister. And as you mentioned, Minister of External Affairs and the other ministers provided a lot of guidance in the process. There's a steering committee overseen by the Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister. It included all the important uh, actors in government, whether it's the NSA, the Cabinet Secretary, the key secretaries of the Government of India. So it was a continuous, uh, I would say, oversight process that, that helped. But you mentioned that who are the people on the ground. And I must say, we had a very, very good team of officers on the ground. Uh, there was Special Secretary Muktesh Pradesi, who worked on the operations side. There was Joint Secretary Samits Ramesh, who worked on all of the um, different meetings, 200-odd meetings that we had across the country. Uh, you had uh, Joint Secretary uh, Smithy, who was from the audits and accounts, and who did a fantastic job on the branding aspects. Vasudeva Kutumbakam has been not just an Indian brand, but become a global brand, uh, our theme and logo. And you had Joint Secretary Security Bhavna, Saxena, who handled all security-related issues across the country. Uh, and below them, there was a team of uh, very, very competent army officers, uh, armed forces officers who helped us. And of course, uh, other uh, consultants, uh, you know, people who joined us uh, because of specialties that they had in their expertise and experience. So it's a great team, and I'm privileged to work with, with such a team. Before we get to the specifics, um, you know, it, it became an all-of-India approach, which is what you discussed. So from Kashmir to Lakshadweep, uh, all across, in the northeast as well of our country, uh, how and why was it a goal to ensure that this wasn't a Delhi-centric affair? Well, again, it's the vision of the Prime Minister to ensure that the G20 uh, became a pan-Indian event. It was not confined to the capital. We've had many international events in the past that have been capital-centric. But the G20 was decentralized, democratized, taken to every corner of our country, uh, to tier two and tier three cities that had no experience of international events. And as a result, the people in places across the length and breadth of our country became stakeholders in that process. They yeah. became involved in the process. You've seen the figures that are about one and a half crore of our citizens who directly participated in G20 activities of one nature or the other. Uh, and, and from that point of view, I think uh, it's an extraordinary experience for all of us who've had to really work on hosting uh, quality G20 events uh, in um, different parts of our country. Um, for me, one of the big highlights was um, when we speak about the word inclusion, it's not just financial inclusion, it's also about the inclusion of women. That's something we've encouraged. It's about the inclusion of, of technology for all. But perhaps the biggest inclusion was the African Union. Uh, could you tell us about the significance of that in the context of India being perhaps a voice of the global south? Well, I think, you know, if you saw the Prime Minister uh, in his interview, mention that our links with Africa have been millennium old. I mean, we, we have shared links of trade, uh, you know, uh, uh, social uh, contacts and exchanges over a period of uh, centuries, if not millennia. And, and of course, you also have uh, the fact that we have shared uh, history of uh, movements against colonialism with Africa. In today's context, that relationship has become uh, one which, which has involved mutual support uh, and friendship and cooperation. Uh, and, uh, and I think it was natural that when we talk about uh, the lack of representation in international bodies, that we should think of Africa, um, um, which, which has not been in governance structures. And, uh, and under our presidency, I think it was almost incumbent on us uh, to, to propose that Africa also be given a place on that high table. And in that context, uh, of course, you... Um, would have seen that uh, our engagement with Africa also started with the India-Africa Forum Summit in 2015. Uh, we've done a number of activities uh, with Africa. We also ensured that under our presidency, we had among the highest representations of African countries, uh, which participated in, in all of our meetings right up to the summit. And uh, very, very happy that uh, the African Union could now become a permanent member of the G20. Uh, under our presidency, and I think it's a tribute to the commitment that the Prime Minister made at one stage that we must have Africa in uh, structures of governance, in particular the G20. 
Do you think that parallel to our economic growth, now the fifth largest economy, headed to becoming the third largest democracy uh, economy, our um, international diplomatic presence has also grown? Uh, that this isn't just one event, uh, this is actually a part of, uh, of India being at a global stage in a bigger way than we have been in the past. Uh, well, there comes a defining moment in history and I think we have reached that defining moment where a very major international event like the G20 uh, will propel us into uh, a position of global leadership but based very much on our experiences of a human-centric model of development which we want to take global uh, in collaboration with our partners in the G20 and many of the outcomes that you would see uh, from uh, the document that was adopted yesterday really reflect that desire and that vision to help other countries um, and work with them uh, to also benefit from our combined experiences and expertise in this regard. Let's talk about a few specifics. We have evolved or developed a background of digitalization. There's the technology backend as well, but there's also the experience of having used these systems. So how do uh, these two strands potentially work uh, to meeting the requirements which are very uh, di divergent and different of different nations? Well, you know, uh, every nation has its own approach. Uh, clearly, uh, on the digital level, uh, what India has achieved has been, has been quite extraordinary in the recent past. Uh, the fact that 40% uh, of all global digital transactions mm -hmm are represented, uh, you know, in the UPI. Uh, and the fact that, uh, you know, today uh, more than a billion of our citizens are very active on the digital uh, network, including through payments, etc. Uh, I think clearly we have the lead on digital technologies, the use of fintech, and the use of digital public infrastructure to empower people and to ensure that last mile delivery is attained. And other countries have worked with us in that regard and other countries also have their experiences which is a combined experience. So if you've noticed the G20 has agreed uh, to have a framework uh, for a repository of digital public infrastructure which would be a virtual repository but it would basically mean that uh, other countries can benefit from the experiences and you know whether it's India stack or whether it's any experience of other countries ours is scalable, ours is uh, economical and most of our DPI is open source and, you know, like COVID, uh, through which we yeah. administered uh, over 2 billion vaccines to our citizens, is uh, a, a digital public infrastructure that has been very effective but is available to other countries as and when they want it. They can scale it up or down. And this is what we are seeing. Let us use our experiences uh, in areas such as Jandhan Aadhaar, for example. There are 4 billion people in the world uh, without uh, um, identity cards. There are a billion people without bank accounts. How can we use our digital experience in taking this across and helping them attain those uh, basic uh, requirements uh, that of a digital era? There's been so much which has been spoken about the Chinese president not being here, but I think at the end of the day, the fact that we've got consensus which involved consensus with China is a step forward. It's perhaps premature to link this to the broader, broader concerns that India and China have along our frontier. But do you believe that this is positive in that they sort of backed our efforts uh, at G20? Well, uh, you heard our external affairs minister yesterday when he said that, uh, you know, um, we could not have got a consensus document of this uh, nature, which is very, very substantive, uh, which provides solutions to many of the global issues of the day uh, without uh, the support of each and every member of the G20. So every partner has contributed to the effort and uh, undoubtedly I think uh, we have found all of our uh, partners within the G20 including China supportive in our endeavor mm -hmm. to provide a global framework uh, that, uh, that uh, works uh, to bring about solutions to issues, uh, the socio pressing socio-economic issues of the day. Um, let's just talk about uh, one or two other important issues. Climate is something which is India is focused on greatly. There's the entire issue of climate tech. Um, how does this G20 declaration go a long way towards ensuring that there is equitable access uh, to climate-related technology? Well, um, if you look at the fact that uh, we've adopted uh, the high-level principles for lifestyle for sustainable development, uh, this is one of the uh, areas that Prime Minister had, ex had uh, you know, expounded uh, 
in the past. We have spoken about the fact that it cannot just be nations, but it has to be also people. So sustainable development, uh, sustainable consumption is very important if we are to maintain our goals in terms of climate change. And uh, the high-level principles for a lifestyle for sustainable development have been adopted by the G20. Um, we've also um, ensured that uh, uh, you know, our contribution uh, to a climate-resistant, uh, nutritious uh, grains, such as millets, yeah. are those on which we, will, uh, we have, a, we have a agreement within the G20 that we will do joint research and sure. promote that. We also have the Deccan high-level principles for uh, food grains, uh, which is food security, yeah. which is a very, very critical issue, and it's a, it's an, it's an outcome of climate change. If you look at the fact that we have the Chennai uh, Declaration on Blue Oceans, mm. is also a contribution in that regard. The, the, uh, the uh, desire to do away with plastic, single-use plastics mm. uh, within the G20 is also something that we initiated in our own country, and we've yeah. taken it uh, global. Uh, so our print, imprint on uh, that agenda is very, very strong. And I think, uh, you know, from our point of view, um, it is important that uh, um, through institutions like the International Solar Alliance and the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, we take that forward. Uh, you have seen that we also spoke about One Future Alliance, which is an alliance that would enable countries to collaborate uh, on areas, uh, you know, like... Uh, uh, on, on, on areas that involve uh, biofuels and other areas. That you saw the Global Biofuel Alliance was also yes. there. And, uh, and clearly, um, you know, uh, we will use, uh, and that will also be a part, the ISA yes. will steer the One Future Alliance as well. Yeah. So we are looking at many initiatives right. that have been endorsed by the G20, and I think it's a very significant statement, but very important is the financing. Yes. Climate financing is very important and we've got a commitment from the developed countries and it's in the document uh, that they would uh, fulfill their pledge uh, to provide $100 billion a year from 2020 to 2025 in 2023. Okay. So that's all the and I must ask you one final question. The strategic importance of uh, the potential rail link uh, through the Middle East linking up to India as well, uh, why is that being done? Uh, is it in a sense a counter to China? and its efforts in this region uh, through their own collaborations. So connectivity is very critical and today when we talk about uh, resilient uh, and reliable supply chains, we must ensure that uh, connectivity uh, is, uh, is, a, is an important part of that uh, effort. Uh, and I think our partners within the G20, uh, you know, partners in the Gulf and our partners beyond are happy to support that effort that provides a vital land link connectivity. Right. Historically, we've always had a land link uh, you know, with many of our partners uh, uh, in the Middle East and beyond. Sure. And today, uh, the Middle East uh, Economic Corridor uh, right. will provide that vital uh, link again. And sure. I think uh, the G20 is, is, uh, is, is sort of a, a mechanism through which, uh, you know, we get the necessary endorsements and the support. Wonderful speaking to you, uh, sir. Congratulations once again. So there you have it, Mr. Harsh Shringla, telling us a little bit about not just um, all of the agreements uh, which India has, uh, has managed to get done along with our partner nations, but also about the young people involved, the officers involved, the entire system uh, which sort of worked to make this happen. I have no doubt about it. This is one of um, the, the, the biggest achievements in the history of Indian foreign policy.